Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Let me look at everybody here. All righty. All righty. Everybody's clothed and in your right minds, ready to serve God in the house of God. Praise the Lord. There's only one thing. You look way too comfortable. Let's stand up. Praise God. Man, I got blessed this morning. Wow. Power got rocked me a couple of times. I, I just took a lot of stamina just to stand here. It would have been a lot easier to suck carpet. <laughs> praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. It's still here. Lift your hands. Praise the Lord. Ele bonda haki lemo susu badi vishte. Hurise lemona hukuti amasa bonda hati lemo sukute. Praise God, praise God, praise God. No longer will you go from week to week and service to service and Sunday to Sunday, but rather from glory to glory and glory to glory and glory to glory. One meeting will not end and be a lull and then another one begin, but it will be a continuum, a continuous increase. And it'll happen Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all day, Sunday, more and more and more and more. You will go from glory to glory until you're just in the glory, says the Lord. And you'll walk in the glory, you'll talk in the glory, you'll pray in the glory, you'll celebrate in the glory, you'll fellowship in the glory, you'll dine in the glory, you'll drink new wine in the glory, you'll be with me in the glory, you'll see things in the glory, you'll know things in the glory. And you shall help me spread my glory throughout the earth, says the Lord. As surely as I live, my glory shall spread throughout the earth. It shall cover the earth. When I put my child Adam in the earth, he breathed glory. And when the fall came, the glory waned. But now the glory is in the earth again. Ha, 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 ha. Praise God. Praise God. What was lost in Adam is restored in Jesus Christ. And the glory is available to anyone and everyone who will trust me, says the Lord. Spend more time praying in the Spirit. Spend more time meditating upon my Word. Spend more time giving attendance to the things you've been taught and you've heard. And as you feed your faith, you'll begin to grow glory to glory to glory, and your life will begin to glow with a light that's so bright that it harms the eyes of demons and devils and causes them to run and flee. They cannot stand in my glory. They must depart. So continue to do your part and to manifest my glory, says the Lord. We can do that by lifting our hands right now and worshiping Him. Glory, 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 glory. Glory, ha 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 ha, la masudi bashi kedi bondo hute. Glory, 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 glory. Glory, glory, glory will revive you. Glory will strengthen you. Glory will renew you. Glory will strengthen you. Glory will add years to your mortal life. Glory will empower you. Glory will eliminate strife. Glory is the cure to almost everything. The more glory, the less problems you see. <laughs> so manifest my presence through worship, and my glory will come. Just you wait and see. Praise God. One day I was walking through my house doing some chores. It was a Saturday. And I had a list of things that I wanted to do. And that's what I was thinking about. I wasn't fasting or praying. or I was just doing little chores around the house. 
And I came out of the kitchen and I walked through the dining room into the living room and the glory of God was in my living room. And I fell to the floor. I mean, I'm just walking through there and I just, next thing I know I'm on the floor and Jesus is sitting on my sofa, all aglow. And I fell and, and, and began to whine and cry and, and, and kind of blubber, blowing snot bubbles. And I said stupid things. You know, we think we're pretty smart until we get in the presence of God, then we don't know what to say. Job said, I, I had to put my own hand on my mouth, you know, just to keep from saying something stupid. And, and I did say some things stupid. I said, I didn't know you were going to be here. I said, if I'd known you were going to be here, I would have been ready for you. I'd have been prayed up, <laughs> you know, sanctified and holy. But uh, this manifestation lasted quite a while. It, it, uh, I just felt like things were boiling out of me and bubbling out of me and burning out of me. And it, at first it was uncomfortable. No flesh shall, shall uh, what, how's that go, Pastor John? Glory in the presence of God. It's humbling. It's humbling. We think we're all that until we get in the presence of God. And it's so glorious. But the more His glory penetrated me, the lighter I became and, and the, the calmer. And so finally I just sat there on the floor and stared at him and he stared at me. I just smiled at him. He smiled back for a long time. If you had seen that, <laughs> you'd probably thought that was a sight. And uh, then he got up and strolled towards the door. I don't know why I used the door. It's but I guess just to signal to me that, you know, this, this little episode was winding down. And he got to the door, and he stopped, and he looked back as if to ask non-verbally, is there anything you want before I leave? You know how you, you are with people you love. You can kind of communicate without talking. And he just gave me that look like. And I said, by the way, my finances have been down a little bit. And he nodded at me. A nod from God. Hallelujah, praise God. Now, I'm talking about $1980, not $2018. And amazingly, over and above my normal bankable income, an extra $500 came to me that week. And the next week, an extra $500 came to me. It's always $500. It happened 52 weeks in a row. Hallelujah. 500 bucks just like clockwork. Praise God. Do the math on that. Praise God. Uh, now, you, you, think, you think I was imagining all that. Well, let me tell you what. The banker must have thought I was imagining it too because he took the money. Hallelujah. And the merchants must have thought I was imagining it too because they took the money too. Hallelujah. And I spent that money. Praise God. It's good to have an extra $24,000 supernaturally show up because you get a nod from God. Oh, hallelujah. I'm telling you, glory is the kabod of God. It's the substance of God. It's the gold of God. It's the wealth of God. It's the prosperity of God. When you go into the presence of God, you come out with the riches of God. He is rich in glory. Hallelujah. You need to suck it up tonight. You need to absorb it. You need to feel after it. You need to take hold of it. You need to make it your own. You need to get all the glory you can get. I don't know why your hands are down at your side. You ought to be reaching up and reaching towards Him and taking a hold of it. Hallelujah. Praise God for the the glory of God, the manifested presence of God, the essence of God, the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. You'll be like Obedidim. 
the, the, the Ark of the Covenant and the glory cloud came to his farm. And three months later, he was retired. He was too rich to work as a farmer anymore. He went to Jerusalem and became a choir member. Praise God. Hallelujah. And the only thing that changed was the glory of God rested on his property. Hallelujah. Let your glory rest on us tonight. Let a permanent manifestation of your visible glory be here a cloud by day, a fire by night, burning bright. Hallelujah. Let it happen right here at Believers at Madeira in Jesus' name. You ought to give the Lord a great big hand clap for His glory. Praise Him for His glory. His glory, His glory, His glory. Glory, glory, glory. Praise God. Well, lift your hands up. Let me bless you. Father, I pray for everyone here. That every burden be removed, every yoke be broken, no distractions, nothing to hold us back or keep us from receiving from you, no personality conflicts, no, no envy, no jealousy, no distractions by other people, what they're thinking. We don't really care what they're thinking. Praise God. We're here to experience you. We're here to receive more from you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. You've got a way of taking care of all of us. You have a way of communicating to all of us. You have a way of fixing all of us. And I'll tell you what, people, I'm here to get mine in Jesus' name. I'm going to help you get yours, but I definitely am going to get mine in the name of the Lord. I'm leaving here with glory. Hallelujah. The currency of heaven. Glory. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Bless these people. And let them leave here with glory. We want to deposit from heaven. Praise God. We want to take it home with us. We want it to go to work with us. In Jesus' name, praise God. Hallelujah. Even your livestock and pets will change when you come home with the glory. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Praise God. Um. Matthew 10, 41, Jesus said, Receive a prophet because he is a prophet, and you get the prophet's reward or wages, riches. There is a divine relationship between the prophet and the body of Christ because God set in the church apostles and prophets. And right up there in that list with the other fivefold ministry gifts is a very special gifting called the office of the prophet. Now, everyone can prophesy. Um, his spirit is being poured out on all flesh and sons and daughters prophesy. Everyone can. Uh, well, even Balaam's jackass prophesied. So don't get all big-headed about it. People, God moves on them to prophesy, and, and then the, their ego swells up, and they think, well, I must be the next Ezekiel or what have you. Um, no, believers prophesy. That's what we do. We speak by the unction of God, by the oracles of God, speak the truth in love. But the office of prophet is different. It's a divine ordination. It's chosen by God. He chooses certain people. Not everyone's an apostle. Not everyone's a prophet in this sense. Not everyone is a God-anointed uh, prophet. Uh, Evangelist. One of my mentors was uh, T.L. Osborne, a dear friend of mine. I was blessed to spend quality time with Dr. Osborne, the greatest evangelist of the 20th century. An evangelist, a soul winner, signs, wonders, and miracles. Ah, there'll never be another T.L. Osborne. I had a dream about him one night, and in my dream, he said, Larry! Ideas from God are the seeds from which miracles grow. He's a man with godly ideas. Brilliant. We need some more evangelists. Pastors and teachers. Believe the Lord and so shall you be established. That would be good if it stopped right there. Believe the Lord. Believe His Word. Believe in the Lord. And you'll be established. If we believe on Him, we won't be ashamed. We're on the rock. 
of the revelation of Christ. We can't be moved. The wind comes and the rains, but we're solid. Believe in the Lord. You'll be established. Most people don't have a desire to backslide. Most Christians are doing their best to hunker down and survive and hold on. We used to sing about it, preach about it. Just hold on, brother. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away. <laughs> Amen. But the second part of that powerful scripture says, Believe his prophets, and so you shall prosper. There's several shades of meaning there, but one meaning is breakthrough or breakout. Prophets have a breakthrough ministry. I've had breakthroughs. I went to Hyderabad, India when it was a backwater, pioneered it, went in there without anyone or anything, uh, raised the money, rented the field, rented the... Uh, sound system, rented the lights, paid for the advertising, and held miracle meetings. I kept coming back. After a while, other preachers started going into Hyderabad. Well, Dick Burnell went in there, and he had uh, 1.4 million people show up at his meeting. Praise God. I took him, his first trip to India, I took him there. First miracle he ever saw was when he went with me. First time God ever used him to cast a devil out of somebody. Praise God. Breakthrough. I've held breakthrough meetings all around the world. Breakthrough. There's something about the anointing that breaks chains off of people and breaks bondages off of people and removes the spiritual cataracts from people. Breakthrough. There's certain things that happen in those kind of prophetic meetings that won't happen anywhere else. You see, the prophet doesn't just prophesy. He releases things in the earth. God uses him as a mouthpiece, as a vessel, to release things. And uh, there are times great boldness comes upon me. Great, great boldness. And I'm amazed sometimes at what I hear myself saying. But that's the Spirit of God. The righteous are as bold as lions. They do great exploits. You let the Lion of Judah get a hold of you, you'll be saying some, you'll be roaring too. Praise God. Breakthrough. Breakthrough. What we were experiencing this morning was breakthrough. Breakthrough. That was a breakthrough service. You could feel things breaking off of people. You could feel the glass ceiling being shattered. You could feel us going forward. It's real interesting the way the meetings are. You know, you start off, you're kind of noodling around, saying some things. People say, oh, what's this all about? And next thing you know, kabam! Sneaks up on you. <laughs> praise God, praise God. I mean, there's a method to the madness. Believe it or not, I, I kind of have an idea of what I'm doing. Sort of. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, su I'm surprised oftentimes. And, and thank God. But, you know, it's been a while that I've been at this. It's been... 45 years. And a lot of what I've done, especially the exciting part, has been pioneer stuff. Going where there wasn't any work done. Paul said, I did not build on another man's work. I understand that mentality. Pastor John asked me, he said, uh, do you know people in Spain? I'm going to Spain. I said, no. I said, I could meet people, but I really don't want to do that Amway networking that multi-level thing. I want to have divine connections. I've done this for years, divine connections, like, you know, Philip joining himself to the Ethiopian's chariot, divine connections. And those are exciting. And for me, uh, every time I go on an overseas assignment or crusade, that happens all the time. I took a Swedish fellow with me, Tobjorn Hansen, and he could not believe it. Strangers would walk up to me just out of the blue and, and, and ask me to pray for them and start telling me everything about their lives, and I'm just like this, just like uh, bees coming to honey. And uh, that's because I'm so sweet. And, and, and Toby told some people later, he said, have you ever been, traveled with Brother Huggins? 
And he began to explain to them how there's something supernatural that just connects me. Well, that's the gift. That's the gift. Hallelujah. Prophets are set in the church, but we're not confined to the walls of the church. We, we, uh, we go places on assignments. And there's always a purpose for it and a reason. I want there to be a, a reason for me to go places, not just because I want to preach, not because I want to take up an offering, but something divine. Do some kingdom business. Praise the Lord. Believe your, His prophets and so shall you prosper. The word receive a prophet implies get to know your prophet. Know who he is. Value him. Know what he means to you. Start to understand him. Relationships with prophets are not just one night stands. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, you know, help you understand this. It's a relationship. Sometimes prophetic relationships last for decades and decades. I have people that have been connected with me for decades. Um, some come and go. Some it's just an encounter. But I have other kinds of relationships, divine partnerships, that God has put together, and they last for decades. Decades. That uh, Shunammite woman, her, her relationship with her prophet, Elisha, lasted decades, probably over 30 years, maybe longer. If you go back and look at that timeline, she had been feeding him when he came into Shunem. Then after a while, he got in the habit every time he was in Shunem, which wasn't every day, maybe, you know, maybe annually, he would turn in there because she fed him. And so she tells her husband, have you noticed this man of God keeps coming here? Well, yeah, lady, you've been feeding him. Even, a, even, a, even an old feral dog will come home if you feed him and follow you home. And so she tells her husband, uh, let's build him a room up on top of the wall and furnish it. And so he had a home away from home. And every time he was in Shunem, he had lock and key. That was his place. Those were his things. Well, that didn't happen overnight. We're talking about years. Well, then, uh, because of all of her kindness, Elisha asked, well, what does she need? Well, she kind of downplayed it, said, I dwell among my people. And Gehazi spoke up and said, well, she has no child. Her husband is an old guy. And so the man of God released a miracle into her life for childbirth. How long does that take? All right. You see the timeline? The lad grew up. He's old enough to go out to the fields to work beside his father. He's not a boy anymore. He's not an adolescent. He's a young man. And he has an accident, and he hits his head, and he's dying. In fact, he died. And the woman goes out looking for her prophet. I get funny sermon titles every now and then. The Bible says she saddled her ass and rode to the prophet. That'd be a pretty good book, wouldn't it? <laughs> and then, later on, her husband had passed away. We don't know what happened to the boy. He's not mentioned uh, uh, he is mentioned later, but uh, um, the prophet warned her that there would be a famine and told her to go to the land of the Philistines, and God sustained her for seven years. So you see the timeline? If that boy was 30, that's 37, plus the gestation period, plus the time of, of, of the home on the roof and the building of the home, and plus the time she spent feeding him. So how long did her relationship with her prophet go? Could have been 40 years. Could have been 50 years. That's not how people are today, especially when it comes to the prophetic. 
people go online and they read lists of prophets and they pick and choose what they want to without knowing them that labor among them. That is an abuse of the office of the prophet. And as far as I'm concerned, those prophets are culpable. They shouldn't let people do that. We should be build, uh, bridge builders. We should connect people. Believe the prophets. Young people, going starting off in life and marriage, they dream a lot about marriage. You know, every young girl has a Cinderella complex and every boy has a Peter Pan complex. And and they have these I they have these idealistic ideas about marriage and their marriage is going to be different. And then there's the wake up call. <laughs> and let me tell you something, it's gonna take three, five, seven years the rest of your life to adjust. But it gets better. And my wife and I have a lovely, lovely relationship. We just, we're just so comfortable with one another. We enjoy one another's company. We spend time together. Uh, it's sweet. We trust one another. Uh, we're okay being separate. We're okay being together. She lets me have my space. I let her have her space. But we always enjoy the time we share. And we pray together and read the Bible together. And we go to movies and have fun. Go out to eat. We go on dates. Have, have a lot of fun, go for walks in the evening. It just gets sweeter and sweeter. But it wasn't always that easy. You get to know people. You know, when you meet a, a preacher for the first time, it's kind of funny because I, I have a traveling ministry, and I, I know people are shifting gears. I know they're analyzing me. I know they're trying to figure me out. And you can just feel it. Everybody's radar, and they got their antenna out, and they're trying to figure out who is this guy, and what's he going to do, and what kind of rabbits is he going to pull out of the hat. And and uh, a lot of times, a lot of times, this has happened to me over and over and over, some young alpha male will come up to me and say, I owe you an apology. I always know what's coming. And I say, oh, yeah, what's that? Well, I misjudged you. I thought you were conceited. And the Lord showed me, you're just confident. And I said, that was easy, wasn't it? Give me a hug. Because, <laughs> you know, that's kind of how males are. It's like, uh, you know, there's a new stallion in the Ramuda. Ask him what that means. He's from West Texas. Kind of troubles the whole herd, you know. But when you've known someone for as long as you've known me, it gets easier to receive from me. You got you 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 you're not guarded all the time. You got your shields down. Your heart is open. That, that's what happens when you know those who labor among you. And it gets easier and easier. The 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 more relationship I have with people, the easier it is to minister to them because they know me. They know my motivation. They know they understand my sense of humor, even though it may be a little uh, wacky or crude. They understand that. You know, there's a method to what I do, and God uses me a little different. You know, everybody's different. There is a scripture that says, the spirit of prophecy is subject unto the prophet. Now, there are different ways to look at that, but let's talk about it this way. It is impossible for our personality to stay out of the equation. I have a personality. You have a personality. And God will use you and your personality, warts and all. Idiosyncrasies and all. And we don't have to pretend. We don't have to posture. We don't have to do any play acting. We don't have to copy someone else. Just be yourself and let God use you. The spirit of prophecy is subject to the prophet, and that's not a bad thing. We bring our own flavor to it. I stopped at Starbucks one day on a road trip, and I, I, I bought myself a real nice stainless steel thermos. Did I say stainless steel? Impermeable stainless steel 
thermos. I got out to the car, my wife saw it, and she had thermos envy. So I had to go back in and buy her one. We had two identical stainless steel thermoses, vessels, if you will. I like coffee. She likes tea. I don't get that. She's always trying to give me teas. Pastor Warren, she's got a tea for everything. She's got to get up in the morning tea. She's got to go to bed tea. She's got a diuretic tea. She's got to help your brain tea. She's got every kind of tea in the world. And let me tell you something, they all taste like seeds and stems and weeds, and it's wangy. <laughs> wangy. Do you say wangy out here in California? Ask him. He's from West Texas. <laughs> you have to get an interpreter for some of this stuff. I don't know how it happened, but somehow she put her tea in my stainless steel thermos. I washed that thing. I went, it, I went through every wash cycle you can think of, and I could not get rid of the flavor of tea. I put boiling water in it. I put vinegar in it. I put baking soda in it. I tried everything in the world to get rid of that wangy, seedy, stemmy tea flavor in my stainless steel vessel. Honey, I don't care how hard you try, you cannot erase your personality. God knows it, and He's going to use you. Hallelujah. There's not some cookie-cutter prophecy prophet thing that we got to do, you know, where we walk around, wave our hands over everybody. <laughs> Thus saith the Holy One of Israel. Oh, quit that stuff. That's a, that's a bunch of mumbo-jumbo. That's not real. That's not how people really are. I'm prophesying to people all the time, and they don't know I'm prophesying until it hits them because I'm having a conversation with them. They, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that? I got some stories. My wife is leaving on an airplane in Tulsa, and she said, would you, uh, would you go by Sears? There's a vacuum in the back of the car. I want you to exchange it. I said, okay. Went to Sears. I became supernaturally hungry for barbecue. Not good barbecue, famous Dave's Yankee barbecue, which is an unnatural urge to get. But I had to have it. And there on the parking lot of the shopping mall was a famous Dave's, so I got in my car and I drove around and I pulled up. And while I'm sitting in my car, I noticed a brand new Cadillac pull up and I watched it pull into the parking place. And a guy came out of it. It was kind of fascinating. I was just watching this fella from my car. And he got out. He had kind of long blonde hair, page boy thing. And he flips it. <laughs> I'm not going the way that you think I'm going with this. And he's all, he's all Gucci and Ferragamo. He's, he's, a, he's the Italian stallion, man. He's got the silk shirt with the sun button all the way down here and the Mr. T starter set and the Rolex watch and the big rings and, and the Ferragamo loafers, you know. And uh, you say, how do you know about all this Italian stuff? I have you know I've done my DNA and I'm 1.5 Italian. <laughs> and it's a strong 1.5. <laughs> My wife said, I should have never gotten you that DNA test. I'm walking around the house saying, tutto grazie, che bella, you know, making stuff up. So I'm watching this guy. I don't know why, I'm, I'm a prophet, I watch everything. And he walks into famous Dave's Barbecue. So I go in and I see him over there sitting by himself, and I get my food and I sit down by myself. Look at my food, I look at him, I pick my food up, I went over. And I put it on his table. I said, hi, Larry Huggins. He said, Gino. <laughs> yeah, of course his name is Gino. <laughs> he said, sit down, Larry. Talk to me. I just start talking to him. Kind of random stuff. And he says, how do you know that? I say something else. How do you know that? I say something else. Are you investigating me? He said, no, I'm not investigating. Are you with the FBI? No. And he's paranoid. I said, relax, Gino, relax. He said, you know things that nobody knows. 
How do you know it? I said, well, it's an occupational hazard. I'm a man of God, and the Holy Spirit shows me things. While we are sitting there, this guy breaks down in tears. He starts confessing his sins to me. He is a made mafioso. <laughs> and he tells me things that I shouldn't know. And he's given me this thing about a piece of artwork he has in the back of his car that he had to recover. He said, don't ask. He said, you like, uh, you like Larry Neiman and uh, uh, Leroy is what the, most people call him, but if you're on the inside, it's Larry. And I said, well, I like his early stuff. He said, well, you would like this. And after we go through this whole episode, I, he's actually crying. He's saying, I'll never forget this. I want to meet you again. And uh, we're getting ready to leave. And I said, hey, you're going to show me that uh, Larry Neiman picture. I'm going to catch him if he's lying. He opens up the trunk, and here is an original, early Leroy Neiman painting. I don't know what he did to recover it, but there it was. I didn't ask. It just happens to me just happens. It's my way of rolling. It's how I do things. It's how I do things. I got into a taxi in San Francisco. I had a preacher with me. Taxi cab driver says, where to, boss? I said, Gandhi Nagar. He said, hoo, hoo that's my village in India. I said, I know it is. I'm in a hurry. Let's go. <laughs> Gandhi Nagar. <laughs> I'm in communist China. Sitting at a table next to me is a man. I'm alone. He's alone. I said, where are you from? He said, oh, a place you've never heard of. I said, try me. He said, Elo, Peru. I said, oh, you mean next to Tacna over near Makewa? He said, who are you? <laughs> Freaky, isn't it? <laughs> Freaky. On a train going through California here, sitting beside a a Viking from Denmark. Behind me is a guy from India. Taps me. He says, have you ever been to India? I said, I've been to your hometown, Hyderabad. He said, oh, yeah, I'm from Hyderabad. I said, I know your friend Prasada Rao. He said, you know Prasada? I said, until he died. He said, who are you? <laughs> freaky, freaky stuff. That's how I roll. That's how I roll. That's how I do things. You have to kind of get used to the way the man of God, the woman of God does things. You have to allow that. You have to allow that, let them be natural. I don't know how to be anybody but me. I don't want to be anybody but me. I rather like being me. Jesus died for me. He approves of me. He's called me. So I'm okay with that. You young preachers, stop trying to style yourself after other people. That's phony. Don't be a copy. Be an original. Every man and woman of God I know that's been really close to God becomes eccentric. Is that the truth? We're talking about Lester Summerall tonight. That guy is so eccentric in a good way. I mean, when God made him, he broke the mold. There are no two. This world is not big enough for two Lester Summerall's. Praise the Lord. Quirky, too. Quirky. Ed Dufresne, quirky. He's dead. I can talk about him. <laughs> Those of you that know him, you know exactly what I'm talking about. He's quirky. <laughs> what were you telling me tonight? Ed fell out of a car going down the highway, and the guys in the car didn't know he was falling out, and Ed's running around beside the car. <laughs> quirky. They're in a restaurant. Ed falls out of the chair onto the floor. The waitress wants to call 911. They said, go ahead, put the paddles on him. <laughs> so what's wrong with him? He said, nothing, he's nuts. <laughs> That's one of the occupational hazards. You get close to God, and you're going to be more like heaven and less like earth. More like the original and less like the copies. Hallelujah. You're going to be more of who you are and who God has called you to be. You're going to be free. You're not going to care what anybody thinks about you. If God's for you, who can be against you? Your happiness is not found inside of someone else's head. You're all the time wondering what other people are thinking. Don't flatter yourself. They're not thinking about you. 
You're thinking, what are they thinking? They're probably thinking about a ham sandwich. They're not thinking about you. That is the height of conceit to think that everybody's thinking about you. Everybody's watching you. Get rid of that paranoia. We're not doing it. Believe it or not, we have bigger fish to fry. There are things that are more entertaining than sitting around watching you. And if there happen to be people who've made it their life's ambition just to watch you and think about you, entertain them. Their lives are boring. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said that with as much love as I could. Yeah, you gotta learn you gotta learn how to receive from your prophet. Any man of God, any woman of God, you gotta learn how to receive. Learn how to receive. Praise God. I want to help you learn how to receive. No one has my story. No one's been where I've been. No one's done what I've done. It's a pretty interesting story, too. A few people were kind of surprised. We said, we're moving to Spain. Other people were, yeah, okay, that's, uh, that's not surprising. <laughs> they know me. I'm, I'm good for about two years anywhere. <laughs> Maybe a little more sometimes. But only if I get to go out and come in and get out. And play. I'm in Mexico, and there's guys at a table. I say, hey, where are you from? He said, oh, a place you've never heard of, Denaire. <laughs> I said, oh, you mean down near Warren Mar? No, I didn't. I said, near Turlock, between uh, Madera and Modesto. I'm in Oklahoma. I asked this guy, where are you from? He said, a place you've never heard of, Kaufman, Texas. I said, oh, really, near Terrell, right down the road from Wills Point, over near uh, Quinlan? It's kind of freaky, really. That, that's how I roll. I want to tell you uh, one more story, if you'll allow me, and then I have some things uh, I need to do. The, God's given me assignment tonight. There's some people here who are scheduled to have a conversation with the Lord. He's going to have a conversation with you, Brian, Pastor John, Darren, and we'll see how far that goes as the Lord leads. There are times when we just minister to the ministers and bless the leaders because in blessing the, the leaders and the ministers, then we are multiplying the blessings in the body of Christ. So when your leaders receive a blessing, you need to, you need to rejoice. Praise God. I have a friend in Monterey, Mexico named Dr. Hector Rocha. Dr. Hector Rocha was on the International Advisory Board for Bahamas Faith Ministries, Dr. Miles Monroe. Anybody here ever read a book by Dr. Miles Monroe? Uh, God uh, raised him up as an apostle to Bahamas and the Caribbean and third world nations. He had a revelation of kingdom. The kingdom of God is just sterling. He's one of my heroes. I love Dr. Monroe. He passed away in a tragic airplane accident a couple of years ago. Dr. Miles Monroe, what an amazing ministry, Bahamas Faith Ministry still is. They're continuing to this day, building upon the foundation pioneered by Dr. Monroe. My friend Hector Rocha was on the international advisory meeting, so when they had their big conference in Nassau every year, Hector was there. And they're back in the hospitality area that's reserved for ministers and speakers. A lot of people milling around talking. And Dr. Monroe is having a conversation with the husband and wife ministry team. And Hector's standing nearby and he can hear it. And this is what he heard. He heard Dr. Monroe say to the couple, Well, that is a very good vision. I believe it's a vision from God. But you should pray and ask God to have a prophet prophetically confirm that vision before you act upon it. You should pray for confirmation. And he said, when David and I were praying about starting Bahamas Faith Ministry, we prayed and asked God to confirm it. We had a list of bullet points for a vision. And a young prophet by the name of Larry Huggins called me and David up 
and he confirmed every point on the list supernaturally. And after we got that confirmation from Larry Huggins, we had the faith to step out and start Bahamas Faith Ministries International. Hector said the hair stood up on his arm. Afterwards, when Dr. Monroe was alone, Hector went and said, I'm sorry, I was eavesdropping. Tell me the name of the young prophet again. Dr. Monroe says, you know Larry Huggins? He said, yes, I do. He said, I've lost contact with him. Hector said, pulled out his phone, he said, he's on my speed dial. Uh, I'll never forget when I went to the Bahamas at his invitation. That red carpet through the diplomatic zone, the red zone, brought in as an ambassador of Christ, treated with diplomatic courtesies. I've never been treated so royally in my life. Miles Monroe had a vision of kingdom living that few people have, of a dignity and royalty and authority. If you want to bless yourself, get a hold of some of his books on the kingdom. See, the Bahamas is part of a kingdom, the United Kingdom. I lived in England. Sweden has a king. Norway has a king. The Netherlands has a king. Spain has a king. King Felipe VI. Kind of a good deal living in a kingdom because there's a different climate. There's a different mindset. We overthrew King George and did our own thing in this country. But it's not a bad thing having a king. Constitutional monarchy. Different mindset. Different way to perceive things. You live in a kingdom. You and I live in a kingdom. It's a theocracy. It's not a democracy. We don't get to vote on this. It comes from the top. God releases decrees and instructions. And ours, our part is to obey to the best of our ability with all of our heart. For the word of the king is... There is authority. There is power. I'm good with that. I, I like that. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Pastor Brian, uh, do you mind standing up? This is going to confirm uh, some words that you've gotten through the years. I'm not privy to those words in the natural, but I know in my spirit some of the words that have been spoken over you, and it has to do with you. It has to do with your character, your calling, and it has to do with where God has put you geographically. You've been compared to Caleb. The Bible says another spirit was with Caleb. He was a Kinzonite, proselytite, wasn't born a Jew, but he's a lover of God. And at 80 years old, did I say 80? <laughs> You're ahead of me. At 80 years old, he went to Joshua. He said, I, was, I fought with Moses for 40 years. I fought with you for 40 years. I'm as strong as I've ever been. And I'd like to have a, 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 a little a sabbatical here because I'm going to go to Kadesh Barnea where the sons of Anak are, the giants, the ancestors of Goliath, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to displace them out of their walled, fortified cities. Give me that mountain. I want you to point towards it right now. And I want you to say it, everybody. Give me that mountain. I want you to prophesy it. Give me that mountain. One more time. Give me that mountain. You are a watcher upon the wall. I have given you the higher ground so that you can see far. You'll see what comes upon the horizon before others know. I placed you in that elevated place so that you will see what others don't see. And you will hear before others hear. And you will already be prepared and you shall sound the alarm because you are a watchman upon the wall. You are a warrior. You are a fighter. You are 
a policeman for God. That hasn't changed. The other was just a parallel of who you are in the Spirit. Praise God. Hallelujah. And the devil knows it, and he's afraid of you, and your authority goes much further than most people know. If you allow it, it'll happen. If you don't allow it, it won't happen. That's the way it is. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Open these eyes that they may see above the horizon and know things before others know. I've set you a watchman. Praise God. Ha ha le mo su ku de ba se mo na ha ha ha. Praise the le mina yesu ku di a ma sha ka te le. Mon ze bin de la mo hu. Where are the watchmen? Where are the watchmen? In biblical times, if the watchman fell asleep at his post, he was stripped, stripped naked and had to run naked through town home. He was ashamed. He was humiliated. There's a tremendous responsibility that comes with being a watchman. It is a lonely job. It is a solitary job. People don't recognize. They don't understand. They will never understand. The, the spirit of the prophecy is subject to the prophet. You can't shake it. You can't fake it. You might as well take it. Praise God. Be who God's called you to be. Say what He tells you to say. Do what He tells you to do, and it doesn't make any difference what people think about you. If God's for you, nobody can be against you. Everybody here, give the Lord a big hand clap. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor John, if you'll just stand up right beside your chair. David said, My heart is indicting a good matter, and my tongue is as the pen of a ready writer. Revelation knowledge. God has not broken the seals and shared the secrets for you to keep. He shared them for you to release. This Bible school is more important than you think. This school of discipleship is more important than Mike thinks, than Karen thinks. God has trusted you with information that he wants you to disseminate, to release, and a large part of your Latter-day ministry will be releasing this legacy of knowledge. You know more than you know you know. And once you get into the flow, it's going to grow. You're going to be reminded of things that you've heard and seen. And even more will be added as you pen, write, broadcast, record, preach your latter days, it's important that you go into depth and systematically, progressively, exhaustively teach these important subjects. There are lots of people who are touching on the mundane, the everyday, the common, psychological, motivational, but you're going to be revelational. Paul said, I certify you that my gospel was not by man, but received by God. We're not releasing a new gospel, but we are releasing insight into the gospel of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Praise God. Hallelujah. You'll know things about the Holy Spirit, things about the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, things about faith, things about prayer things about authority, and some will be things you've heard and learned, and others will be things that God has personally imparted, but it's important that you make this your job. Go to work every day with your pen and paper, in Jesus' name. F.F. F. Bosworth said that he never went to sleep without putting a yellow tablet of paper and two sharp number two pencils on the nightstand beside him. For the Holy Spirit, he said, would awaken me in the middle of the night and in two minutes give me revelations that would take me two hours to write down. 
Praise God. He'll visit you in the night season. Praise God. Everybody here, lift up your hands. God is still breaking seals and releasing revelation knowledge, divine insight into the true nature of things. Praise God. Don't follow after fads, people. Don't follow after religious trends. Don't, don't follow the crowd. Don't follow some charismatic pied piper who's going to lead you down the primrose path. Know those who labor among you and give them double honor for, their, for the word's sake. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. You've got to know your prophet. You've got to know your pastor. You've got to know those who labor among you. Praise the Lord. Honor them. Give them double honor. Help them. Praise God. There are three stages in the life of a, of a Levite, we're not Levites, by the way, but we can learn a lesson here. Stage number one, disciple, learner. Stage number two, rabbi, teacher. Stage number three, judge, overseer, supervisor. In the New Testament, when you read the word elder, it really the most literal meaning is the one you should look at, older. Older. We live in a society that despises older people, disrespects over pe older people, rebels against older people. Let me tell you something. It took 20, 45 years of full-time ministry in 70 nations and 50 states to make Larry Huggins. That's a very valuable 45 years. That is graduate school. That is postgraduate school. So you shouldn't despise your elders and their gray hair. The, the, the hoarfrost on the head of us older one is a crown of glory. Praise God. We earn these gray hairs. Hallelujah. Praise God. You can learn a lot just by living a long time <laughs> and seeing a lot and experiencing a lot. And so give honor to your elders and listen to them. They've been through things that will help you. They, they've learned things that will help you. A lot of young people think they know it all. No, you don't. You don't have enough sense to find your rear end with both hands in a dust storm. He's from Texas, ask him. <laughs> I mean, the beginning of wisdom is ignorant and you know you're ignorant. That's the beginning of wisdom. When you wake up one day and say, the older I get, the more I know, the more I realize how little I know. Praise God. We, there's a lot God wants us to learn. He wants us to do more, have more, go further than ever before. How many of you are ready to learn and ready to go to graduate school with Jesus? Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. It's real easy to go shopping around on the internet buffet style and picking and choose this and that. That's not real learning. You need to get on your knees. You need to open up the book. You need to invoke the Holy Ghost. Praise God. You need to dig. You need to sift. You need to weigh. You need to analyze. You need to do some critical thinking. God gave you a brain. Use it. Praise God. Well, that went over real big. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. And Darren, my friend, you and Drop, I'm going to let you stand up right where you are. The last time you were here, I uh, released a word into your life about ambassador. Remember? I have not released that word to anybody else that I can think of. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm jealously guarded about who I anoint ambassador. You say we're all ambassadors. No, you're not. Paul was rebuking the Corinthians. He said, we are the ambassadors using the majestic plural. How can he use the majestic plural? Because the ambassador and the king are one. The ambassador doesn't have his own opinion. He doesn't have his own ideas. He doesn't have his own agenda. He doesn't go where he wants to go. He answers to the king. He speaks for the king. What qualifies the ambassador to be the ambassador is the fidelity and the faithfulness of not adding to or taking away from the Word of God, not mixing our own opinion in, not having our own agenda, not trying to do our own thing, but to say what he says and leave it at that. Never put a question mark where God places a period. An ambassador, why most people are not qualified, is because they live in a perpetual state of rebellion. They want to do what they want to do when they want to do it, if it's convenient. The ambassador does not have the luxury of picking where he's going to go, how long he's going 
to stay there, what he's going to say, how he's going to live, because he is the king in another body. He is the proxy for the king. When he speaks, it's exactly the same as the king speaks, because he is not speaking his words, but rather articulating the words of his sovereign. That's why most people are not ambassadors, because they don't speak faithfully for God. They'll tell you what they think. They'll tell you their opinion. They'll give you their two cents. But they have not learned how to speak as the oracles of God. Really and truly, in my mind, there is a great similarity between the ambassador and the prophet because both speak for God. And both are under orders to only say what he tells them to say. People have been asking me, why is Larry Huggins going to Spain? I said, that's a silly question to ask. You know I'm an ambassador. Why would you even ask that question? I had many friends in Washington, D.C. who were diplomats and ambassadors. They're moved around every couple of years. The ambassador of Spain worked with my wife. She was the liaison between the Spanish embassy and the uh, Washington, D.C. public school district. And the ambassador to Spain said, anytime I can help you, call on me. One of my dearest friends was the ambassadress to Uruguay. And let me tell you something. You know what it means when you have the credentials of an ambassador? Diplomatic community. I know you know what that means. Praise God. Hallelujah. Do you know what it means when you're an ambassador? You go in the red zone. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. You know what that means? There are diplomatic messages that are passed that no one else is privy to. There's information that no one else is privy to. Do you know what it means to be an ambassador? It means that you go where your king sends you. You do what your king wants you to do. You represent him in the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you live, the way you dine, the way you sup, the what you drive. You're going to let your king drive a jalopy? Or are you going to let your king wear rags or robes? You're representing the king. That's why the ambassador always lives in a palace. That's why they call him Your Excellency. The proper title of an ambassador is Your Excellency. And what we're doing when we say Your Excellency is we're saying, I'm looking beyond you and I see your king. To disrespect the ambassador is to disrespect the king. It is an act of war. Do not let people disrespect you. You owe it to Jesus to demand the respect of your office that you were called to. They will not understand it. They will say you are haughty. They will say you are high-minded. They will judge you, but no one sits in the seat of judgment. All judgment has been given to Jesus Christ alone, and no one has a right to judge another man's servant. You answer to me. You are free. They don't understand, but I do. There's a reason I chose you and took you from where you are to here to there, and now I'm going to take you everywhere. And you're going to walk in, and they're going to say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is she who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise the Lamo who suits. Something's happening here, church. You ought to be on your feet right now just praising God. We're talking about divine ordinations. We're talking about divine callings. We're talking about setting the church in order. We're talking about recognizing what God is doing by His own design and His kingdom. Praise God. And I'll say this to you, Darren, and drop. I know that you will never embarrass me, and I'll never regret releasing this blessing on you. You'll make me proud to be associated with you, to grow with you, to go with you, to flow with you, to be with you, to stay with you, to celebrate you, to help you do what God's called you to do. 
Ha ha ha. Praise the most CK de bon de ha ha la most CK de vishay. Praise God. I'm going to help you with this idea about ambassadors. An embassy is not where they do business. That's the residence. The chancery is where they do business. That's where the offices and the passports and records are kept. I was invited to the embassy of the Holy See of the Vatican. Do you know that the Vatican is a nation and it's sovereign? When you stand across the threshold, you're now in another nation. You go to the Brazilian embassy, you step across the, through the doorway, you're in another nation. You can hide out in the Ecuadorian embassy if they let you, and nobody can get you. I'm hiding out in the embassy of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I'm living in another nation, another set of laws, another set of values. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. When you start getting the revelation, I'm telling you what, it opens up things. Diplomatic immunity. Praise God. Paladin. <laughs> Everybody lift your hands up right now. The angels are here. They're saying, holy, holy, holy. There is traffic and commerce between heaven and earth taking place right now. The messengers of heaven bringing messages from heaven. Praise God. Praise God. It's time to get serious about my kingdom, says the Lord. Don't go to church. Be the church. Be who you are. It's time to get serious about the things of the Lord. Not just make it a recreational thing that you do once a week, but something that you constantly follow after and seek. Seek His kingdom, and everything you have need shall be added unto you. Get real. Get true. Praise the Lord. I'm ready to raise people up. I'm ready to take you to the next place. If you'll humble yourself in the eyes of the Lord, He will lift you up. The way down is the way up. God resists the proud. He gives more grace to the humble. If you say, I'm not proud, you're proud. <laughs> if you say, I'm not proud, you're proud. You just need to say, help me, Jesus. Help me, God. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Pride is the sin that got Satan kicked out of heaven. Pride is an abomination in the eyes of God. He doesn't give too much thought to some of the fleshly vices that people are involved in, but spiritual pride is a sin of major consequences because it will rob you of your promotions and your blessings. Why get mad at other people because they're promoted? Why get mad at other people because God's using them? The same invitation is extended to you. Celebrate other people's victories. Celebrate them. Um, I'm going to ask our pianist to come. Um, honey, not you because I'm going to pray for you. I want all the young people up here, 20 years or less, I want all the young people to come up here, 20 years or less, make a line right here. The rest of you may be seated. All the young people, 20 years or less. If you're 21 or 22, that's all right. Come on up. Let's drag this out of the way. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Some of you look older than 22. It's like you shave twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. When Israel was taken into captive in Babylon and compared to all the students and scholars and young people in Babylon, God's children, the Hebrew children, fared better than all the children of Babylon. They stood out. You know some of the names. Meshach, Abednego, you are outstanding. This church has some of the most outstanding young people that I've ever seen. 
pound for pound while other kids are squirming around and ignoring the preacher and just looking for an exit plan. The kids in this church, I don't like to call you kids, the young people in this church, are paying attention and feeling after God and receiving God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want you to keep that up the rest of your life because let me tell you something. God brought you into the world at one of the most important times prophetically that history has ever known. And there's a reason for it. There's a purpose for your life. You're going to be promoted to different places, disciple, teacher, who knows. But your experiences right now are going to stay with you the rest of your life. Pastor John, Pastor Mike, Pastor Karen, and I are going to come down the line. We're going to lay our hands on you and bless you. Pastor Mike, Pastor John, Pastor Karen. Let's start down here and work back this way. Where's our piano player? Well, I learned a long time ago, don't pray for the piano player if you want her to play the piano. Because I've been in so many meetings where I prayed for the piano player and she spent the rest of the night sucking carpet. And I learned not to pray for the offering taker-upper. Because they're on the floor and nobody's taking up the offering. And we are going to take up an offering. So who's taking up the offering? I'm not going to pray for you. Pastor John is. All right, let's come down here and pray for these young people. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to get ready to receive from God a breakthrough anointing for your life, for school, for your scholarships, for higher education, for the ministry to move into what God has for you. Come on, lay hands on these young people. Bigger things than you've ever dreamt. God has things in store, step by step, step by step, more and more and more. He's going to raise you up. He's got a place for you to serve and a place for you to be. So just trust the Lord, and He's going to take you to that very special place of ministry. You won't be like others. You're an original, not a copy. So be yourself. Be comfortable in your own skin. God loves you the way you are. He knew you before you were born. And he understood what you'd be like and what you'd do. And God made you you because he has need of you. So accept that and be free. And don't worry about what other young people your age are doing. You're faring much better than the children of Babylon. You're standing out. You're outstanding. You're better in so many ways. Academically better. Spiritually better. Socially better. Better. Because you occupy a special place in God. Yep, 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 yep. yep. You're coming into it. Don't be in a rush. It's going to happen sooner than you think. Bigger than you think. Longer than you think. Stronger than you think. Greater than you think. In Jesus' name, praise God. Now let me tell you something. Of all the people on earth that Brother Larry loves to pray for, it's the young people. I love everybody. But you see... There's so much living ahead for these youngsters. And I know that one word from heaven can change all of their tomorrows forever. God loves you. He has need of you. He's going to use you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Give the Lord a hand clap, everybody. Hallelujah. We worship you tonight, Father. Thank you.
You know, my wife last uh, Sunday shared how the Lord had ministered to her about cynicism, about being cynical. The enemy wants us to think, oh, I've heard all that before. He wants you to stop short of going through the open door. Some people think God's just going to pick them up and drop them somewhere. That's usually not the case. He shows you what to do. Tonight, if you've been listening, he's been, God's been instructing us all night how to go through the door that's in front of us. Because we have now entered into a new day. And God's going to move, start moving even in a new way. He's going to use people who have eyes to see and ears to hear. He's going to use people who will not be dominated by the enemy and his lies and his fear. He's wanting you to stand up, to rise up into a place where you shine with his glory and you're full of his grace. He's asking us to open up the doors of our heart so that his light can shine in and by his anointing and his wisdom he can impart. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I refuse to be cynical. I refuse to be critical. I refuse to let the devil tell me that what God's shown me in the past is never going to come to pass. <laughs> Glory to God. I thank you, Jesus. Because you see, the winds of change are going to blow regardless. They're either going to blow through you or they're going to blow you around, one or the other. I don't even know what I'm saying. I just, I just know the winds are going to blow. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This last week, the Lord opened up Matthew 16 to me. The last four times I've preached, he's had me preach the same message about revelation knowledge. If you've been here in service, you've heard some of those messages. He, op he opened up Matthew 16 to me. It starts off with him rebuking the Pharisees because they didn't know who he was or what season they were in spiritually. And then he told his disciples, don't listen to these guys. They've got leaven in their doctrine. And you're going to be as messed up as they are if you listen to them, basically is what he was saying. <clears throat> then Peter, apparently he caught on. Because all of a sudden he's got this revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus told him, you're operating in the characteristics of God. That's what I'm talking about. You've, you've caught on. You, you're starting to understand. And because you understand, you're going to, have a, you're going to be a rock. You're going to have a solid life. You're going to build your, your life on the rock. And you're going to be able to use that revelation that God gives you to bind and loose. You're going to operate in kingdom authority. And then Jesus began to try to talk to him about some other things. Revelation, him going to the cross. And Peter immediately stepped in and started operating out of his head again. And Jesus had to say, wait a minute, you got it wrong. Now you're being the adversary of God. You've read those scriptures before. Amen? Amen. And then eventually, after that, it says that he led them up to a mountain, Mount of Transfiguration, and the veil was pulled back in the natural realm. And they saw him in his glory in the spirit. They saw Moses. They saw Elijah, two people from the great cloud of witnesses, standing there talking to him about his future and his death on the cross. And when it was over, Peter said, we need to build a monument to this. And a cloud came in. And the father spoke and said, here's what I've been trying to tell you for days. <laughs> this is my beloved son 
hear ye him. Here's, it's my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. And in the original language, it's, it says, hear him and keep on hearing him. It was a whole thing all the way from the Pharisees all the way up through where Jesus was trying to move them into a place where revelation could come to them so they could enter into the season and into the place God had for them. And thank God they got it eventually. We see Peter walking around. That. We're, in a, we're in a similar time right now, folks. God's wanting to take us into some place. And, you're not, and, and you, you know, there's going to be help. Like Brother Huggins was saying, prophetic confirmation. There's going to be things that come from the outside that confirm and things that help us. But nothing is going to substitute you getting before Jesus, listening to him and letting him talk to you about you because he needs to take you through the right door in the right way. And like Brother Huggins was saying tonight, you need to be you in this season. Not the you you think you are, but the you he made you really to be. I hope that makes sense to you. So, Father, we thank you for this time, this season. We thank you for what's ahead. I know things are going to shake, rattle, and roll in this earth. I know things are going to shake, already shaking, but they're going to shake even more in every realm, every level of society. We're going to see your voice shake the heavens and the earth. But it's going to shake the things down that need to be shaken down and leave the things that need to be left and establish the things that need to be in our lives. This is not a little unimportant group of people I'm talking to here tonight. This is a remnant people of God that God wants to use in a mighty way. And so, Lord, help us as we come before you and we humble ourselves. We ask you to redefine us if need be. We ask you, God, to... Do what you need to do to take out wrong thinking and put in right thinking. And thank you for the spirit of boldness to step out and to be and to do what you've called us to be and what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for Brother Huggins. We pray for the pastors here that are going to be moving to Spain, going to that nation, God, that you're directing them to. We thank you that the anointing of God is already on them to do that. And we thank you for the open doors. Lord, I thank you for those angels that are going before them to make the divine connections. And I thank you, Father God, that there's a fire set in that country, in that nation, that begins to blaze across Europe. The devil thought he had Europe all locked up and locked down and set up for the things that he's going to try to do in these end times. But, God, you have come in, and you have given them the key of David, and they're unlocking the destiny, the destiny of those nations and the people who sit in darkness are going to see a great light. And I thank you, Father. I thank you that it's not going to be some laborious, hard thing, but, God, they're going to be like they have jet engines on them. They're going to just be thrust into the harvest and move in glorious ways, awakening a generation of young people to step into their destiny. Father, we thank you for them tonight, and I pray that you'll just quicken us. Use us to pray for them. Use us to give financially. Use us to do whatever you want us to do. Because, Father, we know that you're moving in ways that we've never seen before in the days just ahead. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Let's just lift our hands and thank God that we're here tonight. He's with us. He's moving. He's leading. He's guiding. Thank you, Father. I praise you. Yeah, um, you know, uh, Bowen, I just, when I was praying for you earlier tonight, and um, when I had my hand on you, I just, <clears throat> the Lord began to talk to me about you being a seer and seeing and having dreams and having visions. And 
they've already started in your life. There's things you can think of right now that God has been showing you maybe in your nighttime hour, even in the past when you were younger, that it was branded in your spirit for your future. And um, and I don't know, I've never, you've never talked to me about this or anything like that. I've never even talked to your mom and dad about any of this either, but God's going to start showing you things. He's going to open up the realm. I mean, you're even going to, you're even going to have like open visions at times too into the heavenlies and into the the region and the places you're at, but where God also wants to take you in the future as well. So don't let those things freak you out. And you can talk to your dad about that more. But God's going to use you to see. He's going to show you things. And just ask him, okay, Lord, why are you showing me this? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? And don't get you know, anxious about it. Just let the Lord show you. He might show you something tomorrow. It might not come another 20 years from now. I don't know. But the realm of seeing and knowing in your life is going to grow. That gift is going to grow, and he's going to use you in that. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, at the feet of Jesus is where you'll get what cannot be taken from you. And he's calling us all to his feet. Some of us he's going to take up to that mountain of transfiguration. Amen. I'm telling you, it's you and him. Get with him. Amen. Amen. We're going to receive love offering before we leave tonight. Lift your hand if you need an offering envelope. While we've received these last three services, money cannot buy. Can't put a price on it. I so appreciate Brother Huggins being candid about the prophet's office. You know, it's not easy, at least it's not for me, in your humanity to get up and talk about yourself or talk about something God's doing through you at times. But you know what? Jesus did it. Brother Kenneth Hagin said that the, when the Lord appeared to him that time, that long uh, open-eyed vision he had with Jesus, he said the Lord told him, he said, every city I went to or every place I ministered, I read... Isaiah 61, is it 61? Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord's upon me. Because he said, I read that or I quoted that to the people. And if you look at that, he was telling them, here's who I am and here's what I'll do. Here's who I am and here's why I'm, I'm here. Praise God. We need to be bold in who we are and what he's called us to do. Amen. So if I had plumbing problems at my house and a plumber knocked on my front door and he didn't identify himself to who, uh, who he was, how could I get my plumbing fixed? Amen? So the men and women of God that God sends to us in leadership ministry or whether it's just another brother in Christ, the person sitting right next to you might have an operation of the Spirit in their life that you need. And we need to identify that and be bold about it and let the Lord use us. Amen? The world's waiting for somebody to declare the light. So in giving tonight, just open your heart to the Lord. Maybe you've already given in one of the offerings and don't just say, well, I've given already. Just open your heart to the Lord and see what he would have you do. God knows all the needs, and we're trusting him to meet them. Father, we thank you and praise you for the blessing and the goodness that you have for Brother Larry. Thank you for he and Loretta and all that they've meant to us down through the years. Lord, my natural man says, man, they're going to be on the other side of the ocean so far away, but yet I know this day and age we live in, it's really not that far, number one. And number two, we're going to be able to fellowship with them as your spirit directs. We thank you for that. But we sow into the nation of Spain as we give tonight. We sow into all that you are leading them to do. And it's our privilege to be in partnership with them as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. You can go ahead and receive it. Who uh, had something happen in their life today in this meeting? You, maybe your body got healed pain left your body or something changed just wave at me if you if something happened in your in your life today praise god what happened to you karen praise god
swollen, painful knee. The, heal, the swelling went down. You got healed. Hallelujah. Stand up and talk loud so they can hear you. Cry, forgive me. My dad. <laughs> my dad's a Vietnam veteran. And he has suffered for, from PTSD for many years. He's a good dad. He takes care of us. But when I told him what happened this morning with, with y'all praying for him, first of all, he felt something around 11 o'clock when we were doing that. And my daddy is... I mean, God, he's just not spiritual, okay? He's just not, not, not set. But, um, but number two, he just grabbed that handkerchief and he cried. Thank you. Amen, amen. God's working. The prodigals are coming home. This is a time for the prodigals to come home. Glory to God. If you, and I, I don't know it all, but, if we really knew where we were going in the days right here, where we're, what we're going into right now, we'd be climbing the walls. Amen, Pastor Purcell. I believe that. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus is so good. Let's stand up. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Now receive what's been imparted to you. War a warfare with it. When the devil tries to tell you a lie this week about what happened to you this weekend, you tell him you're the liar, and I'm not receiving your lies. And you begin to decree what the Lord has decreed. Father, I thank you that the anointing of God is upon your people. I command the peace. I release the peace of God in Jesus' name upon their lives. Let the wholeness of God come upon them. And, Lord, I thank you that as they walk out this door tonight, they walk into their week this this coming week, Lord, that you use them for your glory. Give them divine appointments with people to minister that anointing and that love that you ministered to them this weekend. And God, I thank you that you change the world around them through them this week as they walk with you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week and be blessed.